Okay. It's cold. It's rainy. I think it's a perfect atmosphere for me to read some more of something Look at This Way Comes. I got this wonderful mug of tea that my wonderful best friend gave me. And, uh, yeah. How about we get started? I'm also talking really quietly. I probably shouldn't do it, but it just feels right. I just keep my mouth very close. Okay, thank you, Gulliver. I will keep my self close to this mic. And hopefully, you don't have to turn up your computer too loud. But based on previous recordings, you probably will, so I'm sorry. Anyway, chapter 19. Out on the highway, the last faint watercolors of the sun were gone beyond the hills, and whatever they were chasing was so far ahead as to only as to be only a swift fleck now shown in lamplight, now set free, running into dark. Twenty-eight, gasped Jim. Twenty-eight times. The merry-go-round, sure, Will jerked his head. Twenty-eight times I counted. One around back. Up ahead, the small shape stopped, looked back. Jim and Will ducked in by a tree and let it move on. It, thought Will. Why do I think it? He's a boy. He's a man. No. It is something that has changed. That's what it is. They reached and passed the city limits and swiftly jog. Will said, Jim, there must have been two people on that ride. Mr. Cougar and this boy. And no, I never took my eyes off him. They ran by the barber shop. Will saw but did not see a sign in the window. He read but did not read. He remembered he forgot. He plunged on. Hey, he's turned on Culpepper Street. Quick! They rounded a corner. He's gone! The street lay long and empty in the lamplight. Leaves blew on the hopscotch chalked sidewalks. Will, Miss Foley lives on this street. Sure, fourth house, but... Jim strolled, was casually whistling, hands in pockets. Will with him. At Miss Foley's house, they glanced up. In one of the softly lit front windows, someone stood looking out. A boy, no more and no less than twelve years old. Well, cried Jim softly, the boy, her nephew? Nephew, heck, keep your head away. Maybe he can read lips, walk slow. To the corner and back, you see his face? The eyes, Will, that's the one part of people that don't change. Young, old, six or sixty, boy's face, sure, but the eyes were the eyes of Mr. Cougar. No, yes. They both turned, they both stopped to enjoy the swift pound of each other's heart. Keep moving. They moved. Jim held Will's arm tight, leading him. Did you see Mr. You did see Mr. Cougar's eyes, huh? When he held us up, fit to crack our heads together? You did see the boy, just off the ride? He looked right up near me, hidden the tree, and boy, it was like opening the door of a furnace. I'll never forget those eyes. And there they are now, in the window. Turn around. Now, let's walk back easy and nice and slow. We've got to warn Miss Foley that what's hiding in her house, don't we? Jim, look, you don't give a darn about Miss Foley or what's in her house. Jim said nothing. Walking arm in arm with Will, he just looked over at his friend and blinked once, let the eyes come down over his shiny green eyes and go up. And again, Will had the feeling about Jim that he had always had about an almost forgotten dog. Sometime every year, that dog, good for many months, just ran out into the world and didn't come back for days, and finally did limp back, on all bird and scrawny and odorous of swamps and dumps. He had rolled in the dirty mangers and foul dropping places of the world, simply to turn home with a funny little smile pinned to his muzzle. Dad had named the dog Plato, the wilderness philosopher, for you saw by his eyes there was nothing he didn't know. Returned, the dog would live in innocence again, tread patterns of grace, for months, then vanish, and the whole thing start over. Now, walking here, he thought he could hear Jim whimper under his breath. He could feel the bristles stiffen all over Jim. He felt Jim's ears flatten, saw him sniff the new dark. Jim smelled smells that no one knew, heard ticks from clocks that told another time. Even now... Even his tongue was strange now, moving along his lower and now his upper lip as they stopped in front of Miss Foley's house again. Hmm. I need to work on my mic placement here. 
it's a bit too high and it's obstructing what I'm trying to read. There we go. The front window was empty. Going to walk up and ring the bell, said Jim. What, meet him face to face? My aunt's eyebrows, Will, we got to check, don't we? Shake his paw, stare him in his good eye or some such. And if it is him. We don't warn Miss Foley right in front of him, do we? We'll phone her later, dumb. Up we go. Will sighed and let himself be walked up the steps, wanting but not wanting to know if the boy in this house had Mr. Cougar hid, but showing like a firefly between his eyelashes. Jim rang the bell. What if he answers? Will demanded. Boy, I'm so scared I could sprinkle dust. Jim, why aren't you scared? Why? Jim examined both of his untrembled hands. I'll be darned, he gasped. You're right, I'm not. The door swung wide. Miss Foley beamed out at them. Jim, Will, how nice. Miss Foley, blurted Will, you okay? Jim glared at him. Miss Foley laughed. Why shouldn't I be? Will flushed. All those darn carnival mirrors. Nonsense, I've forgotten all about it. Will, boys, are you coming in? She held the door wide. Will shuffled a foot and stopped. Beyond Miss Foley, a beaded curtain hung like a dark blue thunder shower across the parlor entry. Where the small, uh, where the colored rain touched the floor, a pair of dusty small shoes poked out. Just beyond the downpour, the evil boy loitered. Evil, Will blinked. Why evil? Because. Because was reason enough. A boy, yes, and evil. Robert, Miss Foley turned, calling through the dark blue, always falling beads of rain. She took Will's hand and gently pulled him inside. Come, meet two of my students. The rain poured aside. A fresh, candy-pink hand broke through all by itself, as if testing the weather in the hall. Good grief, thought Will. He'll look me in the eye. See the merry-go-round in himself on it, moving back and back. I know it's sprinkled on my eyeball as if like I've been struck by lightning. Miss Foley, said Will. Now a pink face stuck out of the dim, frozen necklaces of storm. We got to tell you a terrible thing. Jim struck Will's elbow, hard to shut him. Now the body came out of the dark, watery flow of beads. The rain shushed behind the small boy. Miss Foley leaned toward him, expectant. Jim gripped his elbow fiercely. He stammered, flushed, then spat it out. Mr. Crosetti! Quite suddenly, clearly, he saw the sign in the barber's window. The sign seen but not seen as they ran by. Closed on account of illness. Mr. Crosetti, he repeated, and added swiftly, He's dead. What? The barber? The barber, echoed Jim. See this haircut? Will turned, trembling, his hand to his head. He did it, and we just walked by there, and the sign was up, and people told us. What a shame. Miss Foley was reaching out to fetch the strange boy forward. I'm so sorry. Boys, this is Robert, my nephew from Wisconsin. Jim stuck out his hand. Robert, the nephew, examined it curiously. What are you looking at, he said. You look familiar, said Jim. Jim, Will yelled to himself. Like an uncle of mine, said Jim, all sweet and calm. The nephew flicked his eyes to Will, who looked only at the floor, afraid the boy could see, would see his eyeballs whirl in, with, the remembered, with the remembered carousel. Crazily, he wanted to hum the backward music. Now, he thought, face him. He looked up straight at the boy. And it was wild and crazy, and the floor sank away beneath, for there was the sh pink, shiny Halloween mask of a small, pretty boy's face, but almost as if holes were cut where the eyes of Mr. Cougar shone out, old, old eyes, as bright as sharp blue stars, and the light from those stars taking a million years to get there, and through the little nostrils cut in the shiny wax mask, Mr. Cougar's breath went in steam, came out ice, and the va valentine candy tongue moved behind... Thank you, neighbors. And the valentine candy tongue moved small behind those trim white candy kernel teeth. Mr. Cougar, somewhere behind the eye slits, 
went blink-click with his insect Kodak pupils. The lenses exploded like suns, then burnt, chilly, and serene again. He swiveled his glance to Jim. Blink-click. He had Jim flexed, focused, shot, developed, dried, filed away in dark. Blink-click. Yet, this was only a boy, standing in a hall with two other boys and a woman. And all the while, Jim gazed steadily back, feathers unruffled, taking his own pictures of Robert. Have you boys had supper? asked Miss Foley. We're just going, we're just sitting down. We gotta go. Everyone looked at Will as if amazed he didn't want to stick there, here forever. Jim, he stammered, your mom's home alone. Oh, sure, Jim said reluctantly. I know what. The nephew paused for their attention. When their faces turned, Mr. Cougar inside the nephew silently went blink-click, blink-click, listening through the toy ears, watching through the toy charm eyes, wetting the doll's mouth with a Pekingese tongue. Join us later for dessert, huh? Dessert? I'm taking Aunt Willa to the carnival. The boy stroked Miss Foley's arm until she laughed nervously. Carnival? cried Will, lowered his voice. Miss Foley, you said... I said I was foolish and scared myself, said Miss Foley. It's Saturday night, the best night for, ten the best night for tent shows and showing my na nephew the sights. Join us, asked Robert, holding Miss Foley's hand. Later? Great, said Will. Or great, said Jim. Jim, said Will. We've been out all day. Your mom's sick. I forgot. Jim flashed him a look filled with purest snake poison. Flick. The nephew made an x-ray of both showing them, no doubt, as cold bones trembling in warm flesh. He stuck out his hand. Tomorrow, then. Meet you by the sideshows. Swell, Jim grabbed the small hand. So long, Will jumped out the door, then turned with a last agonized appeal to the teacher. Miss Foley? Yes, Will? Don't go with that boy, he thought. Don't go near the shows. Stay home. Oh, please. But then he said, Mr. Cassetti's dead. She nodded, touched, waiting for his tears, and while she waited, he dragged Jim outside, and the door swung shut on Miss Foley, and the pink, small face with the lenses in it going blink-click, snapping shot two coherent, incoherent boys, and them fumbling down the steps in October dark while the merry-go-round sta started again in Will's head, rushing while the leaves in the trees above crackled and fried with wind. Aside, Will sputtered. Jim, you shook hands with him. Mr. Cougar, you're not going to meet him. It's Mr. Cougar, all right. Boy, those eyes. If I met him tonight, we'd solve the whole thing. Sh if I met him tonight, we'd solve the whole shooting match. What's eating you, Will? Eating me? At the bottom of the steps now, they tussled in fierce, frantic whispers, glancing up at the empty windows where, now again, a shadow paused. Will stopped. The music turned in his head. Stunned, he squinched his eyes. Jim, the music that the Calio played when Mr. Cougar got younger. Yeah? It was a funeral march. Played backwards. Which funeral march? Which? Jim Choppin wrote only one tune. The funeral march. But why played backward? Mr. Cougar was marching away from the grave, not toward it, wasn't he? Getting younger, smaller, instead of older, and dropping dead? Willie, you're terrific. Sure, but... We'll stiffen. He's there. The window again. Wave at him. So long. Now walk and whistle something. Not Chopin, for God's sakes. Jim waved. Will waved. Both whistled. Oh, Susanna. Both whistled, oh, Susanna. The shadow gestured small in the high window. The boys hurried off down the street. Chapter 20 Two suppers were waiting in two houses. One parent yelled at Jim. Two parents yelled at Will. Both were sent hungry upstairs. It started at 7 o'clock. It was done by 7.3. Doors slammed. Locks clacked. Clocks ticked. Will stood by the door. The telephone was locked away outside, and even if he called Miss Foley wouldn't answer. By now, she'd gone beyond town. Good grief. Anyway, what could he say? Miss Foley, that nephew's no nephew? That boy's no boy? Wouldn't she laugh? She would. For the nephew was a nephew. The boy was a boy. 
or seemed such. He turned to the window. Jim, across the way, stood facing the same direction in his room. Both struggled. It was too early to raise the windows and stage whisper to each other. Parents below were busy growling crystal radio peach fuzz in their ears, alert. The boys threw themselves on their separate beds in separate houses, probed mattresses for chocolate chunks put away against the lean years, and ate moodily. Clocks ticked. Nine. 9.30. Ten. The knob rattled softly as Dad unlocked the door. Dad, thought Will. Come in, we gotta talk. But Dad chewed his breath in the hall. Only his confusion, his always puzzled, half-bewildered face could be felt beyond the door. He won't come in, thought Will. Walk around, talk around, back off from a thing, yes. But come sit, listen. When had he? When would he? Ever. Will? Will quickened. Will, said Dad. Be careful. Careful, cried Mother, coming along the hall. Is that all you're going to say? What else? Dad was going downstairs now. He jumps, I creep. How can you get two people together like that? He's too young, I'm too old. God, sometimes I wish we'd never. The door shut. Dad was walking away on the other side. Walking away on the sidewalk. Will wanted to fling up the window and call. Suddenly, Dad was so lost in the night. Not me. Don't worry about me, Dad, he thought. You, Dad, stay in. It's not safe. Don't go. But he didn't shout. And when he softly raised the window at last, the street was empty. And he knew it would be just a matter of time before that light went on in the library across town. When rivers flooded, when fire fell from the sky. What a fine place the, muse the library was. The many rooms, the books. With luck... No one found you. How could they? When you were off to Tanganyika in 98, Cairo in 1812, Florence in 1492. Careful. What did Dad mean? Did he smell the panic? Had he heard the music? Had he prowled near the tents? No, not Dad ever. Will tossed a marble over at Jim's window. Tap. Silence. He imagined Jim sit seated alone in the dark, his breath like phosphorus on the air, ticking away to himself. Tap. Silence. This wasn't like Jim. Always before the window slid up, Jim's head popped out, ripe with yells, secret hissings, giggles, riots, and rebel charges. Jim, I know you're there! Tap. Silence. Dad's out in the town, Miss Foley's with you-know-who, he thought. Good Gosh, Jim, we've got to do something. Tonight! He threw a last small marble. Tap. It fell to the hushed grass below. Jim did not come to the window. Tonight, thought Will. He bit his knuckles. He lay back, cold, straight, stiff on his bed. Chapter 21 In the alley behind the house was a huge, old-fashioned pine plank boardwalk. It had been there ever since Will remembered, since civilization unthinkingly poured forth the dull, hard, unresisting cement sidewalks. His grandfather, a man of strong sentiment and wild impulse, who let nothing go without a roar, had flexed his muscles in favor of this vanishing landmark and with a dozen handymen had toted a good forty feet of the walk into the alley where it had lain like a skeleton of some indefinable monster through the years, baked by sun, lushly rotted by rains. The town clock struck ten. Lying abed, Will realized he had been thinking about Grandfather's vast gift from another time. He was waiting to hear the boardwalk speak. In what language? Well... Boys have never been known to go straight up to houses and ring doorbells to summon forth friends. They prefer to chuck dirt at clapboards, her acorns down roof shingles, or leave mysterious notes flapping from kites stranded on attic window sills. So it was with Jim and Will. Late nights, if there were gravestones to be leapfrogged or dead hats to be hurled down sour people's chimneys, 
One or the other of the boys would prowl out under the moon, xylophone dancing on that old, hollow-echoing musical boardwalk. Over the years, they had tuned the walk, prying up an A board, nailing it here, lifting up an F board and pounding it back down there until the walk was near unto being melodious, as weather and two entrepreneurs as two entrepreneurs could fashion it. By the tune treaded out, you could tell the night's venture. Will heard Jim tromping, down, tromping hard on seven or eight notes of way down upon the Suwannee River. He scrambled out, knowing it was a moon trail time on the creek leading to the river caves. If Jim heard Will leap out, leaping out about the scattled Airedale on the timbers and the tune remotely suggested marching through Georgia, it meant plums, peaches, or apples were right enough to get sick on out beyond town. So this night, Will held his breath, waiting for some tune to call him forth. What kind of tune would Jim play to represent the carnival, Miss Foley, Mr. Cougar, and or the evil nephew? Ten, fifteen, ten thirty. No music. Will did not like Jim sitting in his room, thinking, what, of the mirror maze? What had he seen there? And seeing, what did he plan? Will stirred restively. Especially, he did not like to think of Jim, with no father, between him and the tent shows and all that lay dark in the meadows. And a mother who wanted him around so very much, he just had to get away get out, breathe free night air, no free night waters, running toward bigger, freer seas. Jim, he thought, let's have the music. And at 10.35, it came. He heard, or thought he heard, Jim out on the starlight, leaping way up and coming flat down like a spring tomcat on the vast xylophone. And the tune, was or wasn't it, the was or wasn't it the funeral dirge played backward by the old carousel calliope? Will started to raise his window to be sure. But suddenly, Jim's window slid quietly up. He hadn't been down on the boards. It was just Will's wild wish that made it made the tune. Will started to whisper but stopped. For Jim, without a word, scuttled down the drain pipe. Jim, thought Will. Jim, on the lawn, stiffened as if hearing his name. You're not going without me, Jim. Jim glanced swiftly up. If he saw Will, he made no sign. Jim, Will thought, we're still pals. Smell things no one else smells. Hear things no one else hears. Got the same blood, run the same way. Now this, first time ever, you're sneaking out? Ditching me? But the driveway was empty. The salamander flicking the hedge, there went Jim. Will was out the window, down the trellis, and over the he hedge before he thought, I'm alone. If I lose Jim, it's the first ever I'll be out alone at night, too. And where am I going? Wherever Jim goes. Lord, let me keep up. Jim skimmed like a dark owl after a mouse. Will loped like a weaponless hunter after the owl. They sailed their shadows over October lawns. And when they stopped, there was Miss Foley's house. Chapter 22 Jim glanced back. Will became a bush behind a bush, a shadow among shadows, with two starlight rounds of glass, his eyes holding the image of Jim calling up in a whisper towards the second floor windows. Hey there. Hey. Good grief, thought Will. He wants to be slit and stuffed with broken mirror maze glass. Hey, called Jim softly. You! A shadow uprose in the dim-lit shade above. A small shadow. The nephew had brought Miss Foley home. They were in separate rooms, or... Oh, Lord, thought Will. I hope she's safe home. Maybe, like the lightning rod salesman, she... Hey! Jim gazed up with that funny warm look of breathless anticipation he often had nights in summer at the Shadow Show window theater in that house a few streets over. 
looking up with love, with devotion, like a cat Jim waited for some special dark mouse to run forward. Crouched. Now slowly, he seemed to grow taller, as if his bones were pulled up by the thing in the window above, which now suddenly vanished. Will ground his teeth. He felt the shadow sift down through the house like a cold breath. He could wait no longer. He leaped forward. Jim! He seized Jim's arm. Will, what are you doing here? Jim, don't talk to him! Get out of here! My gosh, he'll chew and spit out your bones! Jim writhed himself free. We'll go home. You'll spoil everything. He scares me, Jim. What do you want from him? This afternoon, in the maze. Did you see something? Yes. For God's sakes, what? Will grabbed Jim's shirt front, felt his heart bang under the chest bones. Jim, let go. Jim was terribly quiet. If he knows you're here, he won't come out. Will, if you don't go, I'll remember when. When what? When I'm older, darn it, older, Jim spat. As if struck by lightning, Will jumped back. He looked at his empty hands and put one up to the wipe the spittle off his cheek. Oh, Jim, he mourned. And he heard the merry-go-round motioning, gliding in the black night waters around, around, and Jim on the black stallion riding off and about, circling in tree shadow. And he wanted to cry out, look, the merry-go-round. He wanted to go forward, don't you? Forward instead of back, and you on it, around once and you're fifteen, circling in your sixteen, three times more nineteen, music, and you're twenty and off, standing tall, not Jim anymore, still thirteen, almost fourteen on the empty midway, with me, small, me, young, me, scared. Will hauled off and hit Jim hard on the nose. Then he jumped Jim, wrapped him tight, and toppled him roll rolling down, yelling in the bushes. He slapped Jim's mouth, stuffed it, mashed it full of fingers to snap and bite at, suffocating the angry grunts and yells. The front door opened. Will crushed the air out of Jim, lay heavy on him, fisting his mouth tight. Something stood on the porch. A tiny shadow scanned the town, searching for but not finding Jim. But it was just the boy Robert, the friendly nephew. He'd come almost casually forth, hands in pockets, whistling under his breath. To breathe the night air as boys do, curious for adventures that they themselves must make, but rarely happen by. Threshed tight, mortally locked and bound to Jim, staring up, Will was all the more shaken to see the normal boy. The airy glance, the unassuming poise, the small, the easy self in which no man at all was revealed by street light. At any moment, Robert, in full cry, might leap to play with them. Tangle legs, lock arms, bark snap like pups in May. The whole thing would end with strewn, with them strewn in laughing tears on the lawn. The terror spent, the fear mel melted off in dew. A dream of nothing's quickly gone as such dreams go when the eye snaps wide. For there indeed stood the nephew. His face round, fresh, and cream smooth as peach. And he was smiling down at the two boys he now saw locked, limb and limb on the grass. Then, swiftly, he darted in. He must have run upstairs, scrambled about, and hurtled down again. For suddenly, as the two boys outthrashed, outgripped, outraged each other, there was a rain of tinkling, rattling glitter on the lawn. The nephew leaped the porch rail and landed, panther soft, embedded his shadow on the grass. Embedded in his shadow on the grass. His hands were delicious with stars. These he liberally sprinkled. They thudded, slithered, winked at Jim's side. Both boys lay stricken by the rain of gold and diamond fire that pelted them. Help! Police! cried Robert. Will was so shocked he let go of Jim. Jim was so shocked he let go of Will. Both reached at the same time for the cold, strewn ice. Could grief a bracelet, a ring, a necklace? Robert kicked. Two trash cans at the curb fell thundering. A bedroom light above flicked on. Police! Robert threw one last spray of glitter at their feet, shut up his fresh peach smile like locking an explosion away in a box, and shot away down the street. Wait! Jim jumped. We won't hurt you! Will tripped him. Jim fell. The window upstairs opened. Miss Foley leaned out. Jim, on his knees, held a woman's wristwatch. Will blinked at the necklace in his hands. Who's there? she cried. Jim! Will? What's that you got? But Jim was running. Will stopped only long enough to see the window empty itself with a wail as Miss Foley pulled in to see her room. 
When he heard her scream, she knew she had discovered the burglary. Running, Will knew he was doing just what the nephew wanted. He should turn back, pick up the jewels, tell Miss Foley what happened. But he must save Jim. Far back, he heard Miss Foley's new cries turn on more lights. Will Holloway, Jim Nightshade, Night Runners, Thieves. That's us, thought Will. Oh my lord, that's us. No one will believe anything we say from now on. Not about carnivals, not about car carousels, not about mirrors or evil nephews, not about nothing. And so they ran three animals in starlight. A black otter, a tomcat, a rabbit. Me, thought Will. I'm the rabbit. And he was white and much afraid. Chapter 23 They hit the caravel grounds at a good 20 miles an hour, give or take a mile. The nephew in the lead, Jim close behind, and Will further back, gasping, shotgun blasts of fatigue in his feet, his head, his heart. The nephew, running, scared, looked back, not smiling. Fooled him, thought Will. He figured I wouldn't follow, figured I'll, I'll call police, get stuck, not be believed, or run hide. Now he's scared I'll beat the tar out of him and wants to jump on that ride and run around and get older and bigger than me. Oh, Jim, Jim, we gotta stop him. Keep him young. Tear his skin off. But he knew Jim from, but he knew from Jim's running there'd be no help from Jim. Jim wasn't running after, after nephews. Jim was running toward free rides. The nephew vanished around a tent far ahead. Jim followed. By the time Will reached the midway, the merry-go-round was popping to life. And the pulse, the dim... Din, the squeal round of music, the small, fresh-faced nephew rode the great platform in a swirl of midnight dust. Jim, ten feet back, watched the horses leap, his eyes striking fire from the high-jump stallion's eyes. The merry-go-round was going forward. Jim leaned at it. Jim! cried Will. The nephew swept from sight, borne around by the machine, drifted back again. He stretched out pink fingers, urging softly. Jim! Jim twitched one foot forward. No! Will plunged. He knocked, seized, held Jim. They toppled. They fell in a heap. The nephew, surprised, whisked on in darkness. When you're older, when you're older, thought Will. On the earth, when you're taller, bigger, meaner. Oh, Jim, quick! He jumped up, ran to the control box, the complex mysteries of brass, switch, and porcelain covering the sizzling wires. He struck the switch, but Jim, behind, babbling, tore at Will's hands. Will, you'll spoil it! No! Jim knocked the switch full back. Will spun and slapped his face. Each clenched the other's elbows. Rocked. Flailed. They fell against the control box. Will saw the evil boy, a year older still, glide around into night. Five or six more times around, he'd be bigger than the two of them. Jim, he'll kill us. Not me. No. Will felt a sting of electricity. He yelled, pulled back, hit the switch handle. The control box spat. Lightning jumped to the sky. Jim and Will, flung by the blast, lay watching the merry-go-round run wild. The evil boy whistled by, clenched to a brass tree. He cursed, he spat, he wrestled with wind with the centrifuge. He was trying to clutch his way through the pole, through the horses, the poles, to the outer rim of the carousel. His face came, went, came, went, he clawed, he brayed. The control box erupted. Blue showers, the carousel jumped and bucked. The nephew slipped. He fell. A black stallion's steel hoof kicked him. Blood printed his brow. Jim hissed, rolled, thrashed, Will riding him hard, pressing him to grass, trading yell for yell, both fright pale, heart ramming heart. Electric bolts from the switch flushed up with in white stars a gush of fireworks. The carousel spun thirty, spun forty. Will let me up, spun fifty times. Calliope howled, boiled steam ran ancient, dry, then played nothing, its keys gibbering as only chitterings boiled up through vents. Lightning unraveled itself over the seated outflung boys, delivered flame to the silent horse stampede to light their way around. Around, with the figure laying on the platform, no longer a boy but a man, no longer a man but more than a man, and um, even more, and even more, much more than that, around around he's he's oh he's oh look will he's 
gasped Jim and began to sob because it was the only thing to do. Locked down, nailed tight. Oh God, Will, get up. We gotta make it run backward. Lights flashed on the tents. But no one came out. Why not, thought Will crazily. The explosions, the electric storms. Do the freaks think the whole world's jumping through the midway? Where's Mr. Dark? In town? Up to no good? What? Where? Why? He thought he heard the an egg... He thought he heard the agonized figure sprawled on the carousel platform drum his heart super fast, then slow, fast, slow, very fast, very slow, incredibly fast, then slow as the moon going down the sky on a white night in winter. Someone, something on the carousel wailed faintly. Thank God it's dark, thought Will. Thank God I can't see. There goes someone, here comes something. There, whatever it is, goes again. There, there. A bleak shadow on the shuddering machine tried to stagger up, but it was late, late, later still. Very late. Latest of all, oh, very late. The shadow crumbled. The carousel. Like the earth spinning, whipped away air. Sunlight, sense, and sensibility, leaving only cold, dark, and age. In a final vomit, the switch box blew itself completely apart. The carousel, the carnival lights blinked out, and the carousel slowed itself through the cold night wind. Will let Jim go. How many times, thought Will, did it go around? Sixty? Eighty? Ninety? How many times, said Will's face, all nightmare, watching the dead carousel shiver and halt in the dead grass, a stopped world now which nothing, not their hearts, hands, or heads, could send back anywhere. And they walked slowly to the merry-go-round, their shoes whispering. The shadowy figure lay on the near side, on the plank floor, its face turned away. One hand, hand hung off the platform. It did not belong to a boy. It seemed a huge wax hand shriveled by fire. A man's hair... The man's hair was long, spidery, white. It blew like milkweed in the breathing dark. They bent to see the face. The eyes were mummified shut. The nose was collapsed upon gristle. The mouth was a ruined white flower. The petals twisted into thin wax sheath over the clenched teeth, which threw faint bubbling side. Through which faint bubbling side man was small inside his clothes, small as a child, but tall, strung out, and old, so old, very old, not ninety, not one hundred, no, not one hundred ten, but one hundred twenty or one hundred thirty impossible years old. Will touched. The man was as cold as an albino frog. He smelled of moon swamps and old Egyptian bandages. He was something found in museums, wrapped in nicotine linen, sealed in glass. But he was alive, puling like a babe and, shriv and shivering unto death, no, shriveling unto, unto death, fast, very fast, before their eyes. Will was sick over the side of the carousel. Then falling against each other, Jim and Will sledgehammered the insane leaves, the unbelievable grass, the insubstantial earth with their numbered shoes fleeing off down the midway. Uh, I should have maybe made more tea. Chapter 24 Moths ticked off the high tin shade arc light which swung abandoned above the crossroads. Below, in a desert in a deserted gas station in the midst of country wilderness, there was another ticking. In a coffin sized phone booth, speaking to people lost somewhere across night hills, two white faced boys were crammed, holding to each other at each flit of bat, each sliding of cloud across stars. Will hung up the phone. The police and an ambulance were coming. At first, he and Jim had shout-whispered wheezed at each other, pumping along, stumbling. They should go home, sleep, forget. No. They should take a freight train west. No. For Mr. Kruger, if he survived what they'd done to him, that old man, that old, old, old man would follow them over the world until he found them and tore them apart. 
arguing, shivering. They ended up at a phone booth and now saw the police car bouncing along the road, its siren moaning with the ambulance behind. All the men looked at the two boys whose teeth chattered in the moth-flicked light. Three minutes later, they all advanced down the midway, the dark midway. Jim leading the way, talking, gibbering. He's alive. He's got to be alive. We didn't mean to do it. We're sorry. He stared at the black tents. You hear? We're sorry. Take it easy, boy, said one, one of the policemen. Go on. The two policemen in midnight blue, the two interns like ghosts, the two boys made the last turn past the Ferris wheel and reached the merry-go-round. Jim groaned. The horses trampled the night air in mid-plunge. Starlight glittered the brass poles. That was all. He's gone. He was here, we swear, said Jim. 150, 200 years old, and dying of it. Jim, said Will. The four men stirred uneasily. They must have taken him to a tent. Will started off. The policeman took his a policeman took his elbow. Did you say 150 years old? He asked Jim. Why not 300? Maybe he was. Oh, God. Jim turned, yelling. Mr. Cougar, we brought help. Lights blinked on in the freak tent. The huge banners out front rumbled and lashed as arc lights flushed over them. The police glanced up. Mr. Skeleton, the dust witch, the, crush the crusher. Vesuvio, the lava sipper, danced soft, big, painted each on its separate flag. Jim paused by the rustling freak show entry. Mr. Cougar, he pleaded, you there? The tent flaps mouthed out warm lion air. What? asked the policeman. Jim read the moving flaps. They said yes. They said come in. Jim stepped through. The others followed. Inside, they squinted through crisscrossed tent pole shadows to the high freak platforms, and all the world wandered aliens, crippled of face, of bone, of mind, waiting there. At a rickety card table nearby, four men sat playing orange, lime green, sun yellow cards, printed with moon beasts and winged, sun symboled men. Here, the akimbo skeleton play one might play like a Piccolo. Here, the blimp, who could be punctured every night, pumped up at dawn. Here, the midget, known as the wart, who could be mailed parcel post dirt cheap. And next to him, an even little, littler accident of cell and time, a dwarf so small and perched in such a way you could not see his face behind the cards he clenched before him in, in a rift arthritic, arthritic, and tremulous oak gnarled fingers. The dwarf, Will stared. Something about those hands, familiar, familiar. Where, who, what? But his eyes snapped on. There stood Monsieur Guillotine. Black tights, long black stockings, black hood over his head, arms crossed over his chest, straight, stiff straight by his chopping machine. The blade high in the tent sky, a hungry knife all flashes and meteor shine, which desired to cleave space. Below, in the head cradle, a dummy sprawled, waiting quick doom. There stood the crusher, all ropes and tendons, all steel and iron, all bone monger, jaw cruncher, horseshoe taffy puller. And there the lava sipper, Vesuvio of the chafed tongue of the scalded teeth, who spun scores of fireballs up hissing in, ferris, in a ferris of flame which streaked shadows along the tent roof. Nearby in booths, another thirty freaks watched the fires fly until the lava slipper glanced, saw intruders, and let his universe fall. The suns drowned in a, lo in a water tub. Steam billowed, all froze in tableau. An insect stopped buzzing. Will glanced swiftly. There on the biggest stage, a tattoo needle poised like a blowgun dart in his rose-crusted hand stood Mr. Dark, the illustrated man. His picture crowds flooded raw upon his flesh. 
stripped bare to the navel he had been stinging himself, adding a picture to his left palm with the dragonfly contraption. With the dragonfly contraption. Now, with the insect drone dead on in his hand, he wheeled. But Will, staring beyond him, cried. There he is! There's Mr. Cougar! The police, the interns, quickened. Behind Mr. Dark sat the electric chair. In this chair sat a ruined man, last seen strewn wheezing in a collapse of bones, the albino wax on the broken carousel. Now he was erected, propped, strapped in this device full of lightning power. That's him! He was... dying. The blimp ascended to his feet. The skeleton spun about, tall. The wart flea hopped to the sawdust. The dwarf let his let fall his cars and flirted now his mad, now idiot eyes ahead, around, over. I know him, thought Will. Oh, God, they've... What have they done to him? The lightning rod salesman. That's who it was. Squeeze tight, smash small, convulsed by some terrible nature into a clenched fist of humanity. The seller of lightning rods. But now two things happened with beautiful promptitude. Monsieur Guillotine cleared his throat. And the blade above, in the canvas sky like a homing hawk, scythe down, whisper, whisk, slither, slither, thunder rush, wham! The dummy head, chop cut, fell. And falling, looked like Will's own head, own face, destroyed. He wanted, he did not want, to run, lift the head, turn it to see if it held his own profile. But how could you ever dare to do that? Never, never in a billion years could one empty that wicker basket. The second thing happened. A mechanic... Working at the back of an upright, glass-fronted coffin booth, released a tripwire. This made the, a last clog click within the machinery under sign, Mademoiselle Tarot, the Dust Witch. The wax woman's figure within the glass box nodded her head and fixed the boys with her pointing nose as the boys passed, le leading the men. Her cold wax hand brushed the dust of destiny on a ledge within the coffin. Her eyes did not see. They were sewn shut with a laced black widow web, dark threads. A waxworks, fright good and proper she was. And the policeman beamed viewing her, and strolled on, and beamed at Monsieur Guillotine for his act too. And moving, the police were relaxing now, and seemed not to mind being called late on a jolly venture into a rehearsing world of acrobats and seedy magicians. Gentlemen, Mr. Dark and his mob of illustrations surged, for surged forward on a pine platform, a jungle beneath each arm, an Egyptian viper scrolled on each bicep. Welcome. You're just in time. We're rehearsing our new acts. Mr. Dark waved. Strange monsters gaped their fangs from his chest. A cyclops with a navel for a squinted moron eyes twitched on his stomach as he strode. Lord, thought Will. Is he bringing that crowd with him, or is the crowd pulling him along by his skin? From all the creaked platforms, from the muffled sawdust, Will felt the freaks wheel, fix their eyes, and chanted, as were the interns and police, by this illustrated throng of humanity, that in one agglomerative move dominated and filled the immediate air, intense sky with silent shoutings for attention. Now, part of the wasp needle tattoo population spoke. It was Mr. Dark's mouth over and above this calligraphic explosion, this railroad accident of monsters and tumult upon his sweating skin. Mr. Dark chanted forth the organ tones from his chest. His personal electric blue populations trembled, even as the real freaks on the sawdust tent floor trembled. Even as, hearing in their own most secret marrow, Jim and Will trembled and felt more freak than the freaks themselves. Gentlemen, boys, we've just perfected the new act. You'll be the first to see, cried Mr. Dark. The policeman, his hand casually nestled, nestled to his pistol holster, squinted up at the, la at the vast corral of beasts and said, This boy said, said, the illustrated man barked a laugh, 
The freaks leaped in frolic of shock, then calmed as the carnival owner continued with great ease, patting and soothing his own illustrations, which somehow patted and soothed the freaks, said, But what did he see? Boys always scare themselves at sideshows, eh? They're like rabbits when the, freak sh when the freaks pop up. But tonight, especially tonight, the policeman glanced to the erector set paper mache relic constructed in the electric chair. Who's he? Him? Will saw a fire lick up through Do Mr. Dark's smoke clouded eyes, saw him just as quickly snuff it out. The new act, Mr. Electrico. No, look at the old man. Look, Will yelled. The police turned to appraise his demon cry. Don't you see, said Will? He's dead. Only thing holds him up is the straps. The interns gazed up at the great flake of winter flung into and held by the black chair. Oh gosh, thought Will. He thought it would all be simple. The old man, Mr. Cougar, dying so we might... So we bring doctors to save him. So he forgives us, maybe. Maybe the carnival doesn't hurt us, lets us go. But now this? What's next? He's dead. It's too late. Everyone hates us. And Will stood among the others feeling the cold air waft down from the unearthed mummy from the cold mouth and cold eyes locked up in frozen eyelids. Inside, the frozen nostrils, not a white hair stirred. Mr. Cougar's ribs under his collapsed shirt were stone rigid, and his teeth lay under his clay lips were dry, ice cold. Put him out at noon and fog would steam off him. The interns glanced at each other. They nodded. The policeman at this took one step forward. Gentlemen! Mr. Dark scuttled a tarantula hand up an electric brass switchboard. 100,000 volts will now burn Mr. Electrico's body. No, don't let him, Will cried. The policeman took another step. The interns opened their mouths to speak. Mr. Dark flicked a swift, demanding glance at Jim. Jim cried, No, it's all right. Jim... Will, yes, it's okay. Stand back. The spider sw clutched the switch handle. This man is in a trance. As part of our new act, I have hypnotized him. He could suffer injury if you've shocked him from his spell. The interns shut their mouths. The police stopped moving. One hundred thousand vol volts. Yet he will come forth alive, whole and sound, mind and body. No! A policeman grabbed Will. The illustrated man and all the men and beasts a sprawl in frenzies on him now snatched and banged the switch. The tent light snuffed out. Policemen, interns, boys jumped in their flesh at, in cobbles and boils. But now, in the swift midnight stuttering, the electric chair was a hearth, and on it the old man blazed like a blue autumn tree. The police flinched back. The interns leaned ahead, as did the freaks, blue fire in their eyes. The illustrated man glued to switch looked upon the old, old hand glued to switch looked upon the old, old, old man. The old man was flint rock dead, yes, but electricity alive sheathed over him. It swarmed on his cold shell ears, it flickered in as deep as abandoned well nostrils, it crept blue wheels of pow power on his praying mantis fingers and his grasshopper knees. The illustrated man's lips thrust wide. Perhaps he yelled, but no one heard against the immense fry blast, the slam and sizzle of power which prowled in over and above, which prowled in, around, over, under, about man imprisoning chair. Come alive, cried the hum. Come alive, cried the storming color and light. Come alive, yelled Mr. Dark's mouth, which no one heard but Jim, reading lips, read thunderous loud in his mind, and Will the same. Come alive, willing the old man to live, start up, tick, hum, work juice, summon spit, ungum spirit, melt wax, soul. He's dead, but no one heard Will either, but no one heard Will either. No matter how he pushed against the lightning clamor, alive, Mr. Dark's lips licked and savored alive come alive he ratcheted the switch to the last notch live live somewhere dynamos protested skirled shrilled moaned and beast moaned a bestial energy the light turned bottle green ted dead. 
dead, thought Will. But live, alive, cried the machines, cried flame and fire, cried mouths of crowds of livid beasts on illustrated flesh. So the old man's hair stood up in prickled fume, in prickling fumes. Sparks bled from his fingernails, dripped seething spatters on pine planks. Green simmerings wove shuttles through dead eyelids. The illustrated man bent violently above the old, old, dead, dead thing, his pride's beast drowned deep in sweat. His right hand thrust in hammering demanded his right hand thrust in hammering demand upon the air. Live, live. And the old man came alive. Will yelled himself hoarse, and no one heard. For now, very slowly, as if roused by thunder, as if the electric fire were a new dawn, one dead eyelid peeled itself slowly open. The freaks gaped. A long way off in the storm, Jim was yelling too, for Will ha had his elbow tight and felt the yell pouring out through the bones as the old man's lips fell apart and frightful sizzles zigzagged between lips and threaded teeth. The illustrated man cut the power to a whine. Then, turning, he fell to his knees and put out his hand. Away off up there on the platform, there was the faintest stir of an autumn leaf beneath the old man's shirt. The freaks exhaled. The old, old man sighed. Yes, Will thought. They're breathing for him, helping him, making him to live. Inhale exhale inhale exhale yet it looked like an act what could he say or do lungs so 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 someone whispered the dust witch back in her glass box inhale the freaks breathed exhaled their shoulders slumped the old old man's lips trembled heartbeat one to so so the witch again will feared to look a vein ticked a small watch in the old man's throat very slowly now that right eye of the old man opened full wide fixed stared like a broken camera it was like looking through a hole in space with no bottom forever he grew warmer the boys below grew colder. Now, the old and terribly wise with nightmare eye was so wide and so deep and so alive all to itself in that smashed porcelain face there at the bottom of the eye somewhere, the evil nephew peered along and out at the freaks, police, interns, and Will. Will saw himself, saw Jim, two little pictures posed in reflection and not on that single eye. If the old man blinked, the two images would be crushed by his lid. The illustrated man on his knees turned at last and gentled all with his smile. Gentlemen, boys, here indeed is the man who lives with lightning. The second policeman laughed. His motion shook his hand off his holster. Will shuffled to the right. The old spittle eye followed sucking at him with its emptiness. Will scrim left, as did the phlegm that was the old man's gaze, while his chill lips peeled wide to shape, reshape, an echoed gasp, a flutter. From deep below, the old man bounced his voice, ricocheting off the dank stone walls of his body until it fell out of his mouth. Welcome. The word fell back in. Well, come. The policemen nudged each other with identical smiles. No, cried Will suddenly. That's no act. He was dead. He'd die again if you cut the power. Will slapped his own hand out to his mouth. Oh, Lord, he thought. What am I doing? I want him alive so he'll forgive us. Let us be. But, oh, Lord, I even more, I want him dead. I want them all dead. They scare me so much I got hairballs big as cats in my stomach. I'm sorry, he whispered. Don't be, cried Mr. Dark. The freaks made a commotion of blinks and glances. What next from the cold sta 
cold sizzling chair. What next from the statue in the cold sizzling chair? The old, old man's one eye gummed itself. The mouth collapsed, a bubble of yellow mud in a sulfur bath. The illustrated man banged the switch a notch, grinning wildly at no one. He thrust a steel sword in the old man's empty, glove-like hand. A drench of electricity prickled up, prickled from the serene music box tines of the ancient stubbled cheeks. That deep eye showed swift as a bullet hole. Hungry for will, it found and ate of his image. The boys steamed. The lips steamed. I saw the boys sneak into the tent. The desiccated bellows refilled, then pin-punctured the swamp air out in faint wails. We rehearsing. So I thought, play this trick. Pretend to be dead. Again, the pause to drink oxygen like ale, electricity like wine. Let myself fall. Like I was dying, the boys screaming ran. The old man hussed out syllable on syllable. Ha, pause, ha, pause, ha. Electricity hem stitched the whistling lips. The illustrated man coughed gently. This act, it tires, Mr. Electro. Electrico. Oh, sure, one of the policemen star started. Sorry. He touched his cap. Fine show. Fine, said one of the interns. Will glanced swiftly to see, if the, in to see the intern's mouth. What it looked like saying this. But Jim stood in the way. Boys, a dozen free passes. Mr. Dark held them out. Here. Jim and Will didn't move. Well, said one policeman. Sheepishly, Will reached up for the flame-colored tickets, but stopped as Mr. Dark said. Your names? The officers winked at each other. Tell them, boys. Silence. The freaks watched. Simon, said Jim. Simon Smith. Mr. Dark's hand holding the tickets constricted. Oliver, said Will. Oliver Brown. The illustrated man sucked in a mighty breath. The freaks inhaled. The vast, ingasped sigh might have seemed to stir Mr. Electrico. His sword twitched. Its tip leaped to spark sting Will's shoulder, then sizzle over the green blue green explosions at Jim. Then sizzle over in blue green explosions at Jim. Lightning shot Jim's shoulder. The policeman laughed. The old, old man's one eye blazed. I dub thee asses and fools. I dub thee. Okay, hi, Gulliver. I'm trying to do a dead man's voice, and you're just going to be here. I dub thee, Mr. Sickly, and Mr. Pale. Mr. Electrico finished. The sword tapped them. A short, sad life for you both. Then his mouth slit shut, his raw eye glued over. Containing his cellar breath, he let the simple spark swarm his blood like dark champagne. The tickets, murmured Mr. Dark. Free rides, free rides, come any time. Come back, come back. Jim grabbed Will, grabbed the tickets. They jumped, they bolted from the tent. The police, smiling and waving all around, followed at their leisure. The interns, not smiling, like ghosts in their white suits, came after. They found the boys huddled in the back of the police car. They looked as though they wanted to go home.
Part 2 Pursuits Actually, we might end there. Got to chapter 25. We're at part two. So I think that's a good place to stop this reading. So, see you guys next time. Maybe I'll make another recording after this, but really long videos are hard to upload, and this one's already over an hour. So. See you guys next time.